Okay, hi everyone, welcome to Site Gallery. Um, I'm Jane and I oversee public programmes here. Um, we're really pleased to have Anna van Lingen and De Denise Kollerova here from Amsterdam to talk about the legacy of seminal Dutch architect Arda van Eyck. And it's the very last day of Simon and Tom Bloor's platform residency, so if you haven't yet visited, you've come on a very special day. Um, so we're celebrating what they've achieved over the past five weeks. Um, and please do chat to Simon and Tom after this morning's talk. So before you get started, um, do you want to all check your phones or off? We're actually filming the talk this morning for our online <coughs> channel on YouTube, which is great. Um, but yeah, phones off would be great. And um, that's all. Just enjoy. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> uh, so, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Denisa Kolarova and this is Anna van Linen. We graduated together in the uh, Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. And last year we were working together on a project which uh, turned out to be a book which we are going to publish coming year. And that's a book uh, about 17 playgrounds of Aldo van Eyck. Uh, maybe Anna can describe how it all started. Yeah, I think it was one and a half year ago we went on a, on a short tour through the center of Amsterdam and we passed by a few uh, remaining playgrounds that van Eyck designed. And for me, I was so used to them because I grew up in Amsterdam and they're really part of the, of the cityscape. But this was the first time that I actually paid attention to them and I really got to know the, the story behind it and the ideas Van Eyck had while making it. And we were both so interested in the topic that we decided to, to continue researching it a bit more. And um, yeah, we felt the need to really uh, dive into the topic and, um, and maybe share also what, we, what we've come to know with with a bit larger audience. Basically, we never really saw something like this before, or it was just too obvious for us to spot it. And when we made this tour, it was suddenly like, wow, wait a minute, what is yeah. it? Like, I want to know more about this guy. Who, who was Aldo van Eyck? And that's how it all started. And I think also mainly because it's so different from all the other play equipment that we have in Amsterdam. I'm not sure what it's like here in Sheffield, but this is like, you know, you would get a really great out of a night playground and then two blocks away you would find a playground with this kind of elements. So it's such a huge contrast that made us even more interested in, in exploring uh, why yeah. they're such a huge, huge difference, mainly. I mean, these yeah. are the playgrounds you mainly see and you, you kind of recognize them basically because they are very colorful, you can spot them, they usually remind you of something because they are like, almost like uh, some kind of, I don't know, I don't know how I, I describe this, but they are like the elements from the fairy tales. They are too descriptive. They, they look like what they are. They never like, allow you to think about them as something else. And yeah, we found it pretty sad. We, we didn't know why people of nowadays, artists and thinkers and designers, don't reconsider these playscapes and uh, elements. Why they have to be so obvious about slides. And yeah, and, and they, they don't really leave a lot of room for fantasy, I think, or for the imagination of the child. And other than that, I mean, I would much rather have a Van Eyck playground in front of my house than to look at this all day, I think. <laughs> so, um, it gives you a headache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. So, um, we, yeah. Were, we were unhappy maybe with this, this kind of... Uh, it's awful, no? <laughs> ...visual representation of the playground. Therefore, we started to dig in even much more deeper into out of Van Eyck. And uh, while doing the research, we were a lot spending time on the playgrounds of Aldo Van Eyck. Yeah. And yeah. that's why, why we decided basically to share it with people because we felt like, okay, this is the guy, we know about him, but there's so many other people who never heard of his name. And maybe people in Amsterdam, okay, they know it, but we felt like book would be the right way to present it to the broader audience. Yeah, and this is basically a, a small map we did last year um, containing 17 playgrounds, the one that we will discuss, that are remaining in the center. Um, but they used to be over 700, so it's already quite uh, shocking how many of them have disappeared and been replaced by one of the pl like these playgrounds and the play elements that we've looked at before. And we um, decided for 17 of them because they are in this like uh, within the ring of Amsterdam, so basically in the center of Amsterdam, and uh, they are split by west, uh, middle of Amsterdam, and the east part. And we wanted to basically uh, give a tour all around Amsterdam with the ones which are remaining or of the couple of fragments which remains of Aldo van Eyck. Yeah, I think it would be best if we could have brought you all to Amsterdam and talk about his work and his playgrounds while being at the, at the specific locations. I mean, that's also how we did it. We would take a few books and then go to the playground and spend a day there and talk to the parents, talk to the children. Or just listen to the children and I couldn't understand so Anna was constantly, I was constantly translating, translating what they were saying. <laughs> and, and, uh, 
but yeah, so we, I think what we'll try today is we will uh, constantly come back to these 17 places and give you a sort of, sort of virtual tour <laughs> like this. <laughs> so, um, through the yeah. philosophy of Alde van Eyck and through the actual places and the, their, con like their the present state of them at the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is, uh, well, not such a big playground, but just a few uh, elements left that are in uh, Wester Park. It's the west of the city and um, yeah, it's quite funny how these rocks, they're, they're, these jumping stones, they're used by children but also by, uh, by just citizens having lunch there after their work and uh, yeah, it's quite, it's quite great how they have such a different way of using them. And maybe mainly for, for someone who doesn't know about them, it would be just like a simple, I don't know, some kind of an object standing there. But since we know that a child is a very creative being, they can see things in, the, in the things which adults probably don't see. And they are very creative in terms of how they uh, come up with their own games and they constantly play or they see things like in a cardboard of what we would never see. Yeah, I mean, we kind of forget this... Uh or we, we don't really have that capaci capacity anymore, you know, growing older you kind of, or at least it's a pity, but I do think that children have this fantasy in this world and they have this, yeah, they can turn anything into a game and that's quite interesting how to stimulate that and how to design uh, places in a way that you actually activate the child rather than designing uh, something that is already totally set out for them to be used in a certain way. Um, I mean, we show these pictures uh, because we wanted to show you like how how the creativity of the child is like coming out of nowhere. Like it can be anything, and they turn it to something important. But basically, before the war time, there was not so much attention paid to child because there was like this idea that child should be responsible very fast and should become an adult and should go on working. But uh, there was this like breaking point when the book of Benjamin spoke came. And it was like a Bible, right, all over, because he was claiming the idea that the children should be treated as individuals. They should be listened to and they should be paid attention to. And uh, that was quite a, like this, this book was quite a mark in history when the children became a topic. Yeah, I mean, this, it was the, especially this afterward period that they started to really reconsider the position in the child in architecture, but also in art and also in, in uh, social sciences. And, um, uh, well, in Amsterdam, at least, that really made also made the people in the city of Amsterdam aware to reconsider where where the child was able to play and, and what they had to do to also accommodate this. And it must have been quite an era where, of course, architects saw like the children were playing outside on the ruins, and I think it was very inspiring for them also to reconsider it and even think about it that this, they are asking for a place. They really need us to find out the place for them. Otherwise, they will do it themselves and they will be playing with anything what they find around the city. Which is also quite fascinating. Yeah. It's always... Um, basically, uh, like, at that period, there was, like, uh, art, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the period, like, Aldo van Eyck got very much inspired by the artists, which were also inspired by the children, and they are, like, pure uh, expressions, and they're very individual uh, way of dealing with uh, like with uh, anything what they were offered. And there was like hand arp, there was apple. And yeah, he was really Hanag closely was in to, touch with Karo Apple, yeah. who was quite an inspiration to them. And he really, yeah, he was amazed by how they used children as an inspiration uh, in their artworks and how they tried to come back to this naivety and this purity of uh, of their imagination and the freedom they have while drawing, for example, and... Cobra Movement was a good example of it. It was like a compilation of artists which were very much inspired by primitive art and, uh, and the children. He actually... Is, yeah. And we would like to dig in a little bit into also the poetry because Aldo van Eyck was very much inspired by the language and he... Also when he was like dealing with urbanism of anything, of small playground, he was always comparing it into language, how language works. And this is like an example of William Blake, which was his like uh, very big inspiration, or James Joyce, which is of course very well known to probably all of you. And uh, then the painters like Cezanne, Braque, Picasso, and his earlier compositions, Kandinsky, Colmiro, Brancusi, which was also very uh, based on very elementary sculptures, uh, Hans Arp. Constant, Paul Klee, Mondrian, 
and Theo van Dusburg, which also gave him a lot of inspiration for the compositions later in his playgrounds. Yeah, I think we just want to basically tell you guys that he was really, he took so much inspiration from all these different uh, art disciplines and uh, besides that he also came from quite a, a rich cultural background. Um, yeah, I think you can tell something about that later on, but um, in this period in Amsterdam, um, when Aldo van Eyck started to work for the city of Amsterdam, they had quite some problems in the housing stock that they had to solve. The, the housing stock was really falling short quantitatively, but also qualitatively. So, um, and also there were, yeah, there were too many citizens and too little houses for them to live in. Um, and um, Van Eistre, Cornelis Van Eistre was uh, the person in charge to solve these problems. And he did so by making this huge expansion plan for the city. Um, it, it started in the west of Amsterdam and they, he was doing these areas according to this um, functionalist idea. So they were basically these large scale projects um, really dividing the different functions of daily life. So housing blocks would be in one part of the area, then you know the companies in the other, the supermarkets in the other, and the recreation area would be totally at a different site. And yeah, of course, you know, inspired by Corbusier and uh, the SIA movement. Uh, whereas Van Eyck, he, I mean, he was also linked to this group, but at a certain moment he felt the need to work within a more humanistic approach and really look at the at architecture also as a, a way to uh, create relations to people and really look at the, the human scale instead of creating these large, from the top down, uh, new areas. He had, he had much more like hands-on approach, like he much more so like, I have to solve this small situation in order to like in, in presence, I'm not going to make plans for 50 years ahead because like as, as we as a people evolve, anything else can evolve and it's not going to be present. So he much more wanted to deal with the situations at the moment. Uh, yeah, and besides this housing uh, that really had to be solved, also the child didn't really have a position of its own in the, in the city. So even within or outside of the house, there was not so much room left for them, uh, though they would usually just play outside in the streets. But then around this time, there was a huge increase of the number of cars in the city, so it became quite unsafe. Um, and then Jacoba Mulder was the person in charge at the city of Amsterdam, and she came up with the idea of maybe starting to create public playgrounds for the children, because before that there were quite a few, but uh, maybe about 20 or something, but they were all based on membership. So this was really something for the elite. You would go there, they would be fenced off, there would be uh, people guiding your children and, and helping them and making sure that everything was, was safe. And, so it was um, like a high class thing, not anyone could let their children go there. There was like quite a big, big yes, class yeah. difference. Like, it was either that or playing on the streets with whatever you could find. And Jacoba Mulder, one day she was uh, passing by this, this area and she saw a girl digging up sand next to a tree to, f to at least have something to play with on the street. So she really decided to, to uh, change this and to you know, create a, a spot for the children in the city. Um, and Van Eyck was quite interested in doing this also other than, otherwise he would have been helping with these expansion areas, but he really felt more drawn into this project and saw the... I think he felt the potential of that, okay, I'm gonna start like this and if it's gonna be a success, there is children all around and we need to solve the situation, not just like in the center, but it's gonna get like further of the city. Yeah, and not only and the city of Amsterdam realized that it was quite uh, important, but also the citizens and the parents themselves, they were so um, yeah, enthusiastic about this first playground that only a few weeks later, a neighbor that lived just a couple of blocks further uh, sent a letter asking for, for one in front of his house. He was like, if, if they can do it there, why not create one here? And I have a small garden in front of my house, you can use that space. So like this, it slowly evolved and lots of letters came in. We went to the city archive and there's about six meters of letters from parents um, coming up with, uh, with locations for possible playgrounds to be built. Um, so it was a very nice dialogue between the community and the actual architect. So it was not detached, the, the client was not anonymous. But the client was really like a particular person who was in touch with Aldo van Eyck or the yeah. whole thing. And this yeah, is well, actually the first playground. Should I skip or you want to still? No, yeah, I think you can show it. This is the first playground nowadays. Um, and we were there and a group of children came uh, onto oh, the playground. Right. It was quite a, an interesting moment. Uh, we liked it because we were just documenting it empty. We, we decided to do all the shots for the book uh, as uh, images without the children. 
to, uh, to mainly uh, support the, the idea of how they are in the present state. But then we were very happy seeing these children coming to it and like finding right away the, the place for them. Yeah. And we were like, wow, it's not just that it's like, it's not outdated, it's really like no. there and people st like, could still relate to it. So it, it was quite a happiness we felt when we saw this, so we wanted to share it somehow with you. Yeah. Uh, here I would start to talk about, like, in order to understand also Aldo van Eyck as a person, I think it, it's quite uh, important to look into his uh, childhood. And that was basically a very rich childhood from the cultural background. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> I skipped the topic. Okay, That's sorry. fine. <laughs> okay, no, so this is, can I can also tell you something about this. It's, um, uh, these parents, when they send the letters, they they also looked in, in their direct environment to find places where these playgrounds could, could be built. And they often found these spots that were overlooked, that were used just to park cars or to trash things. Um, so he really had this filling up of the spaces as a huge part of creating a web of playgrounds in the center. So this is a really nice series of photographs showing the before, before and after. And after yeah. um, and yeah, it's quite amazing how Van Eyck also used the environment itself. He would always go to the specific site and look at it and, and decide what the site needed to, to create a, a playground that was in harmony with the entire street and not just an, 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 a weird thing placed there without considering what, what the surrounding would look like. Also, that really helped, uh, uh, like before, like Le Corbusier and other architects, they were much more planning it as a big park somewhere in the middle of the city, accessible to everyone. But his, his ideology was much more local and much more site-specific in that terms. Like, it, because it was also coming from the suggestions of the community and of the people, it was uh, always like considered. And we find a lot of these playgrounds in between two houses positioned like that, which yeah. is almost no come, no come nowhere you will go and see contemporary playgrounds. They are always much more placed in open areas, but these were very cozy ones. Yeah, really this which, in between places were, were kind of the spots that he used, uh, but also often on the pavement or um, even on the squares that were um, in the center of Amsterdam, they would use these old squares uh, as as a place to create, as well a playground, as a place for the adults to, to socialize and to sit on benches. And, um... and his compositions were quite well done in the terms that it was never also too dangerous for a kid, as we can see on these pictures, there is never a fence around them or there is never some kind of barricade. They are very much, uh, the composition consists of the thing that child would keep busy, being busy in them and wouldn't even run out of the streets or they were in between two houses, therefore there was no need for any fence or any of these things which we see nowadays all around the playgrounds. I mean, of course, it's great that he used this, uh, these places that were overlooked or that could get this new function of a playground, but it also meant, uh, especially in this um, in-between houses, that, it, that they would only be temporary. Especially now, I mean, in Amsterdam, the space is quite rare and, and expensive. So, of course, if they can choose between putting their uh, parking lot or a residential a parking, house, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. then it's quite an easy choice for the city of Amsterdam. So, lots of them disappeared over the time. Um, but I think this series is a really good example of how he used this, uh, these different places. Yeah. Yeah, for example, here you had a series of houses that were turned down, and uh, also one of the parents of the children there in the neighborhood wrote a letter asking for it. For it's a, a floor plan of the same area. It's basically four houses which were turned down and turned into playground. I think it's quite a luxury for nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> you don't find uh, empty spots like that in Amsterdam now. And basically here I would like to talk about the childhood of Aldo van Eyck because I wanted to, uh, I would like to describe him also as a person who had a very rich cultural background. He was a Dutch uh, person but his father, uh, mother was more of a Suriname origin and uh, they moved to England quite early on since his father got a job uh, in England. He was like a poetry writer and he was writing for a couple of newspapers for an ERC. And since childhood he was introducing Otto van Eyck to literature and his mother was much more of a housewife, but she was very much into plants and she was growing these botanical gardens. And she was also like very much teaching Aldo and his brother Robert into, into like this kind of plants and he was very much intrigued into that. And also 
his grandparents were of Suriname origin and he visited them often in uh, Holland. And early in his writings, you always find him describing this house as some kind of fairy tale. It was a place he came and there was a lot of exotic objects and a lot of things recreating this cultural Suriname origin. And I think there comes a lot of like uh, connection later on in his observations or the way he was creating or designing the playgrounds. And uh, together with the, like his mother and his father decided that he should go to a special kind of school. I think maybe this school is quite well known for you. It's King Alfred School. And it was a school where it was a special kind of education that the child should develop on its own uh, time, that it, there is not like predetermined educational system that you should be by age of six, you should know this and that. And it was very free education. And I think that also let out of an eye go through his life much differently with a, with a kind of this relaxedness of that he's developing and that uh, he was very intrigued and interested in many things. Uh, also in the music, in the writing, he was even playing a flute and uh, he was reading a lot on astrology. There is in early writings he compares a lot of things to astrology and physics and he was even considering to go study language but his father was like, I think you can read the books without studying uh, language let's rather study something else. So it actually came from his father's suggestion of going to architecture, <laughs> where he later on studied in, in Switzerland, in Zurich, actually. Yeah, and his fascin fascination for different uh, fields uh, really grew when he started to travel a lot. He went to North America and he also traveled quite a few times to Africa. And uh, as well, visually, as uh, conceptually, he was really drawn into their architecture and their way of uh, in communities? It was mainly like the Western Africa. He was very interested in the way they were uh, doing the architecture vernacular. It was, it was very human for him and a lot of his writings and inspirations, he comes back to this kind of Dogon culture and the way they were like uh, creating the, the urban village. And uh, he, I think what he liked about it that it was exactly this hands-on approach and it was not, never anonymous. It was always like uh, working within a certain kind of a dialogue within the, within the village. And uh, also he collected a lot of objects and uh, he was constantly talking about uh, very uh, abstract shapes and he was learning a lot of composition and of sy symmetry from these objects as well as from the different kind of African textiles. And I think there is even a, uh, there is a lecture on this where he's trying always to talk about what is, what is the symmetry for him? And uh, these are kind of the examples he also used in this lecture where he's saying that when something is done not by a machine, but by a human hand, it always gets this different way of life in it. I think some of these, uh, especially for me, they really re remind me of the composition he used later on for the playgrounds. Never things are centered, but they are always like leaving the space for some kind of a they, they are always in a rhythm, that's what uh, is apparent in this. And basically his whole ideology of relativity, that everything is based on the relation, was also, there was a nice example when he used ones that, like, it's like a fabric. If you see the wave, waving of the fabric, uh, it's, it's a whole about relativity. If you would cut one thread, everything would fall apart. Therefore, the things have to be in relation to each other and always considered from the inside and outside. I think that's quite... Yeah, you can really relate that to the way he, he set up his playgrounds and the compositions of them. Now we're taking you a bit more to the center of Amsterdam. Uh, in the middle you see the Vondelpark, which is a huge park in, uh, for the, in the city. And there's, I think, three or maybe four playgrounds left there. And there is also very close by, it's a rights museum and satellite museum. And uh, these playgrounds, you can say they're at the moment the most used because they are really in the center and everyone passes them. When the kids are taken from the school, they always, with the parents, they pass by or they stop by. Yeah. So it's like uh, they are in the best stage, I would say. This is in the Rijksmuseum. This is the latest playground, I would say. It's, uh, they took a few of his play equipment in 2012, seven, seven different uh, elements from the western part of the city, um, replaced them by either uh, reprodu reproductions of Van Eyck um, equipment or more modern playthings, and um, they brought these equipments to the garden of the Rijksmuseum. Um, yeah, kind of for children to use, but mainly as a cultural historical monument. And I think it was also really done as a way of 
giving attention, putting sure. attention yeah. to uh, Van Eyck's work, and um, I, yeah, I also slowly started this um, idea within the city of Amsterdam and under architects that they should, yeah, really think of. Um, also maybe mainly because he was very much well known as an architect, but when you say a playground, it's like maybe the secondary thing people think of. Like yeah. it's so obvious that they never think, okay, it was an architect and then there is an orphanage in Amsterdam, but the, I think they really want to highlight the point that this was the man who did these things around us. Yeah. Like. yeah. I think what is really interesting in Van Eyck's um, designs is how he stimulates the, the child to use their imagination. and. He always designs uh, his equipment in a way that, as I said before, that a, a child can use it however he or she wants to. You can climb on this thing, but you can hang from it. If you would put a piece of fabric over it, it can turn into your little house or castle. Um, we spoke to a couple of girls and they were explaining to us that this was their house, this, nice, this was their living room, and this was the front door. No, because we were asking, like, and where is the front door? And they're like, of course, on the top. And yes. we're like, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really uh, yeah, it's so great to see how they make it their own and how they can be used in so many different ways. And even though his, his equipment was basically designed for four to seven, eight year olds, old these are these structures are especially also quite interesting to a bit more older children, to the teenagers. They would also hang out on them and Everyone either smoke like their first cigarette or chat about you know, whatever <laughs> they would do in the weekend. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's open to association for anyone and therefore we find it great that he considered that it should be an impulse for a child, it shouldn't be a solution for it, it should be a challenge for a child. Yeah. And that's the way he designed them. Yeah. I mean, you can also just use them as the, you know, to create some kind of game and run around them and, um, yeah. This is another uh, playground in Wondel Park, there is just leftover the sand pit at the moment. And basically here we would like to introduce you to most of the uh, most of the object designs he, he made. And it's basically, I don't know if I can point here, but these are the jumping stones. Here we have a tumbling bars, sand pits, which were always of a different shape. And almost every play element was always of a different shape. Or he used it as a more as a modular system which was constantly changing and it was like based on a situation on, on the site. He, he decided on how many of, uh, for example, tumbling bars he would attach together, how many of them would frame the playground or... Would yeah, he, cr he created this set of elements that he could reuse like each time. Yeah. yeah, he would call them the tools of imagination, he once said in an interview. Um, and every time that he got pointed to a new site that he could use, either temporarily or for a longer space, he would go back to them and, and find out what would fit in this, certain, in this specific situation. and. Um, I mean, for some of the people it might feel like they are very elementary, but that was the fact which was making them almost like feel so natural to a child that it was just like jumping from one stone to another. Like, it was almost like he took so much inspiration and he tested it also with his own children. That's nice that if they worked, that that's how he was doing the testing of them. Yeah. But he was really a lot observing of what the ch children does naturally and he didn't want it to imply too many functions into a play element. Yeah. So some, some, some viewings from the top, so it's some floor. And he also didn't have one model for the sandpit. He would, you know, he would, one location he would make a round sandpit and the other one he would have a square one. Um, they're always, um, yeah, I think all his playgrounds consist out of four basic uh, elements. So it would be either, um, or not either, because he also always included all of them, but he would always have these metal climbing frames or tumbling bars. And then you had the concrete elements, which are these jumping stones or the sand pits. And uh, quite an important part of his uh, playgrounds are also the benches that he uh, put there for the parents. He really also thought about where to place them and how to um, have the parent interact with their ch children while, while they're playing. Um, and the material they were made of was also very, uh, like, it was melting within the cityscape, therefore it was not disturbing, it was uh, like it, just the material of it, if we compare it to nowadays, it's always a plastic, but that was really like very natural, it was like we said, like it was metal or it was this concrete and of course sand. And once taking these pictures, we also discovered you cannot take a bad picture of his playground. No? <laughs> so yeah, it's like quite so, easy, quite a luxury. So <laughs> aesthetic somehow. Yeah. 
Though, of course, also when we spoke to some of the parents on the playground, they were saying quite the opposite, like, it's horrible. How, how can you come up with the idea of making something from concrete and, and asking children to play on it? It's so, you know, it's so dangerous and, yeah. This is a climbing mountain. I think it's the most sculptural element that he, he designed. And there is not is, so many left in Amsterdam. No, I think this is the last one left. Um, yeah. We have to say that while, while doing a book, we tried all of the elements. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. The nice thing about this one is that it consists of different levels and it teaches the child to kind of get an get a idea of the, of the viewpoints. And uh, I think smaller children can reach certain level and the, the, the more like confident one go higher or higher. So it's quite interesting to also observe how they work with display elements. This is the one in Vester Park. So basically here are some examples of the ones which exist or don't exist. This is the one which still exists. This one is not there anymore. This is the first one that he designed. So it became more sculptural while making more of them. And this is the, the climbing mountain of today, I would say. <laughs> it's also, I think, what we find a bit ridiculous about it is that we, instead of challenging the child, we decide to bring things from the adult life back to children. So, okay, this is what the climbing wall is for us. Let's make it smaller and a bit more approachable for a child and it's going to be what they need. But I, I don't like this approach of reverse thinking. Yeah, then we, we will go to the, let's see, to the climbing frame. And yeah, I think also because we cannot bring you there, we, we made these short clips of these elements to at least, you know, try I think to you get a feeling of a size or of a view of it. I think it's, it's quite interesting to experience this somehow. Yeah, I think that's important, at least for us, when we, when we were looking into it, it's, it, it really helps when you actually go to these places and, and experience them, seeing children using them, using them yourself. And um, yeah, this is a, a different shape that he would use. Also these climbing frames that would come in, in different sizes. And um, this is the one that we saw earlier, the one that the children ran on to. <laughs> I also like how children always, like, there is no three children doing the same thing at them. It's always like very various movements and very various games they develop and they discover. And yeah, yeah, I think what's also quite interesting about his equipment is that they're all designed to be used by different children at the same time. He never makes something that can be used only by one child and the other will be waiting for the child to be done and, and then it would be his or her turn. They're really, yeah, you also really have to Cooperate. Inter yeah, cooperate or interact, or, or maybe not, but it's at least you, yeah, they're designed to be used by many children at the same time. These igloos, they exist uh, in many sizes. I mean, I call it igloos, it's like a climbing frame, but since I saw it, I never got rid of saying igloo. <laughs> but they exist in different sizes, and sometimes they have one entrance, sometimes they have more entrances. This one's it's only the one we, we found left, but it's still not from him. From this one, we found only yeah. one left in Amsterdam. Yeah, this, is, so this one is by him, but at the same location, they, they uh, destroyed this, the original one, and uh, a few years ago, they replaced it by a reproduction. Jumping stones, they were initially made for the, as a play table. It's, so they were like this kind of a proposal for a kid to use it as, as to bake a cake on it, to make some kind of new architectural piece on it. And so first they were used like that, but later on he uh, realized that they have a potential for being also included in a playground itself. It's just the simple stones you can jump off uh, from one to another. And they were also in a different sizes, 
and uh, usually they had the same uh, shape, but they had a different size. And always the distance between them is like achievable for a child to jump from one to another, but it's also not too easy somehow. So it's a very well thought of uh, geometry. Yeah, they also, you also have smaller ones. And I, these jumping stones, they were not only used as a play equipment, but he could also sometimes place them in a way that they would uh, at the same time work as uh, closing off of the playground. So uh, instead of using fences, he would try to use his equipment in, in a multifunctional way. These are some examples in the sandpit. These were actually the favorite uh, equipment of the guys, whereas the tumbling bars were really the, the place where the girls would always go when they would go to this playground. It's quite interesting because I'm not sure if he thought about that, but it's, it's something that we've uh, noticed while going there. That it was really like the guys would run towards these jumping stones and come up with this game who would jump higher or faster, or uh, whereas the girls would do some, uh, I some think tricks on these. And this is more like a gymnastic element also. Like that's why maybe the, the girls were more dragged into this one. But you can also see, especially in this one, that he uh, considered also the different ages of the children using them. So he would not make one specific height, but create a, a, an element which, which you could be using while being really small and just holding yourself to be able not to fall down and then a uh, higher one for the older children. And this is also quite an interesting aspect because I think a lot of the playgrounds nowadays they are created in a form that they can even get a child frustrated that he cannot reach it, that it's, it's just meant for one function and for a certain age and then the child gets very anxious that he cannot, for example, grab it because it's too big for his hands or something. And I think he had a very, very good way of dealing with these things and he thought about it all in the beginning. Yeah. Used also as a place to park your bikes these days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here you can see the different levels that he, he would create them in. And this is again the, the Bertelmann Klein, so the first playground that he designed, but then with a few new elements placed. And here in the back you can also see there is like a small monument because it was the first playground there is a monument that Aldo van Eyck was the designer who was behind these uh, playgrounds. Oh, yeah, another short clip of a, of a sand pit where uh, yeah, it's nice that, he, that these sand pits are not only used as a, as a place for children to to play with the sand and bake cakes or, as you said, make their own uh, yeah, architectural buildings. <laughs> but uh, also this rim was really used to, to run on and also could function as a place to, to play. Um, so he really considered uh, the, uh, how, how big was the rim and how large was it in, for sitting or for doing any other games on it. And what I like especially about this that they are huge. These sand pits are huge. Now that you get a sand pit where three kids can be, and there was like uh, 20 kids like constantly playing with the parents, and there was space for everyone, basically, for the whole street. It was yeah. not just for two people or something. Yeah, this is quite typical for his sand pits as well. He made these entrances for younger children to be able to walk into them themselves as well. These are some of the discoveries we found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here is the example of how the play table is used in, uh, in the center of the sand pit. It's this jumping stone. And they were always uh, in a different shapes. Like he made a square sand pits. He made them in a pentagon, hexagon, circular ones. And especially, this is like a grave in Timudi, and he, this image is quite, oh, it always comes back in all of his books because he found it very inspiring. It's like an anonymous grave, and we can clearly see what was, was the main inspiration for him. It's like this, this lower entrance, which he later on used in most of the playgrounds. <coughs> Actually, this playground is in, uh, in one of these expansion areas because 
he started by filling up these overlooked places in the center and um, they, become so, they became so popular that also the citizens in these newer building blocks wanted a place for their children to play. So um, slowly on they also became part of these plans, but even though they were built in such a number, he would, he would always create them site-specific, he would also always do it them himself, and there is also not one playground that looks the same. They're all different. This is a, a, an example of this uh, composition that we saw before. Here you can see that he really used this um, tumbling bars to, to show where the playground ended. Basically, he always tried to put elements in a way that it would get a rhythm, which rhythm is quite specific for, uh, for any one of us, but he never wanted it to be boring and to be predictable for a child. Therefore, you see that most of the play elements are always shifted or they create some kind of uh, unexpected situation. And he considered the space between different elements as much as the design of the element itself, because he, he liked the uh, idea of that nothing is hierarchical, but the all play elements and the spaces in between are non-hierarchical. Therefore, they, they communicate and they create certain kind of rhythm of uh, how you approach it. Yeah, I think in, yeah, in that sense, the place in between the equipment is, is as important as the play equipment that he placed there. And he also really saw the value of those spots to, yeah, as a place where, where games could take place. And um, a way of really showing that or highlighting that is that he always used different tilings or different colors of tiles to, to show to the child that this was also uh, something they could one use. This is play area, game. this is maybe another play area, so he quite differentiated it. Yeah, this is a nice sketch where he that really shows the idea that he doesn't want to make this centered, uh, uh, closed of spaces. He was, I think, uh, he was always discussing the thing that it shouldn't be a closed of space. It should have a places where the energy flows in and out. So somehow, he was very much dealing with this airiness of the playground. Yeah, he would always start his compositions with a sandpit, but as we said, he would always. Yeah, take it, it slightly off the middle and... Um, Offset it in order. I, yeah, it's also not the case that the sandpit was the most important one. I think all of them are, are equally of the same, yeah. So yeah, this is one of the uh, playgrounds that was built in this after-war expansion areas. This is a good example for his idea of that he saw each space like uh, a beginning of a new space. So therefore, if you enter one place, it's the departure of the other place and the other way around. And he always saw it as a continuation. And I quite like this one because it, it exactly shows these like three circles or, or it's almost like three small squares. And it's actually one playground, but it's, it's very dynamic uh, in, a, in a way it works. He was always also very careful that the parents would see from one point of the playground to the, to the last one in order to keep a track of what children are doing. So he never liked to put something in the center, also not to create a barricade or some kind of wall. Yeah, here you can really see how it kind of becomes a part of the whole street. And I think also his playgrounds, if there's no children in them, they're still quite appealing to look at. It's not one of these things that you zone, that you block out of your view because they, yeah. This is a good example of the, the way he was putting the tiling under the different elements. This is how it looked in real. For me, it always reminds me of like it's almost like a small villages within the city. He never, he always created for a child these kind of elements, which if even the child went with the parent somewhere else to the other part of the city, when he saw these elements, he could really like recall, okay, this is my place, this is where I can go, this is where I can, uh, this is what I recognize basically. Yeah, I think that's also because there were so many of them. Um, so wherever they would go, even if it, if it was either the playground that they knew because it was in their neighborhood, or because it, if it was one in the other side of the town, they would recognize it as their domain. It's like this is this is ours, or this is where where I can play and do whatever I want. And um, yeah, he they, he really created this um, space that would feel like their own. 
but in that case it was also not just for the for the kids but it was like he liked to call them the playground for all the generations because during the day of course when the kids were in the in, in the kindergarten you still could find a lot of people hanging out there or elderly people spending their time there and it was never it, you also don't feel like stupid being there because it's not just for kids but it's it's really it's like visually appealing and it's like this kind of resting place and you can you don't feel also too big for it because it's like it has this perfect scale also for an adult to be part of it somehow. Tourists like them a lot, <laughs> it especially the one in the park. <laughs> it's uh, they they also make movies of each other running through the from jumping one jumping stone, stone to the yeah. other. <laughs> it's a group of people that we didn't really know were interested in his work as well. And maybe nowadays we, we think of like, this is an example of Slovakia, but there is like uh, many playgrounds made for, for adults, but they are not playgrounds, but they are like this kind of a fit room outdoors. And there is, there is the moment where the division between adult and child becomes very apparent, like, okay, so we have a playground for children here, and we have something for adults to do here. And I find it sad because I think he was really good with making it space for everyone and for the whole community, all ages and all generations. Yeah, this is a, ah, this is a, good a example. great example, actually. Um, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, I guess he didn't thought of this while designing them. But it's uh, around 7, 8 o'clock in the evening, they turn into this place for people to exercise. It looks directed, but I'm, I'm saying it's not. It was a coincidence. <laughs> but even then, I mean, it's still used at the same time by this family. Yeah. I mean, imagine this is one of the days we went there. It's like every day there is some kind of scenario happening like this. It's quite amazing. Really quite useful. <laughs> Yes, we went to them afterwards because we got this looks like, why are they taping us? But of course, you don't want to talk to them beforehand because you want to kind of uh, yeah, document what is happening there without guiding them or without uh, making them too aware of themselves. But Only once it happened to us, but it was another location where we were taking our pictures and they said that we cannot take the pictures of the people, children in the kindergartens, no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but it was maybe some kind of special. <laughs> Maybe now there's the biggest issue which we are trying to solve when it comes to the playgrounds, it's always the safety. And there is like coming more and more like rules uh, which are kind of putting some kind of chains on how the playground should look like, how safe they should be. In Aldo van Eyck's case, the, the biggest change which happened since his original play, playgrounds is that the floor was replaced by this um, modern way of floor, which is a sponge floor. This is an example of it. Yeah, because his, this different of use of tiles was quite interesting to highlight these zones in between the equipment as a part of the playground. And yeah, they, sometimes they did think of this and they made it into these uh, circles or colorful green uh, um, parts. But it kind of this element kind of got lost when the when all these safety rules uh, became so important. But other than that, I think in his equipment, it meant that he had to just change the distance between some of the bars so that the children wouldn't get stuck in between them. But besides that, that was that was quite 
okay, but I think what it did do is that nowadays, especially in Amsterdam, I don't know how it's here, but you, when you have a place for a playground, someone in the city of Amsterdam, not, not specifically an architect, but just anyone would, who would get that task, would go to a company delivering play equipment and ordering a few different ones, placing them quite, yeah, without really considering how to place them. Um, and this company would also provide the service, service maintenance, but also would be the one responsible, basically, because of course the city doesn't want to be responsible for all this, for whatever would, could happen in a playground, so. This is, one, uh, this is the last playground out of which is like three jumping stones left and we like it as a transition into playgrounds today since uh, it's the only jumping stones which are colored and uh, they, uh, yeah, I think it's a bit uh, ridiculous what is left over of them because they, they totally become something else. Yeah. And uh, here are some more examples of uh, what is done to the playgrounds of Aldo van Eyck or uh, how they were like not understood enough and how their composition was completely broken just by adding an element which to me doesn't really make sense. This is an, an ex, uh, like example of how it, how it completely changes the view of the playground and how the color interferes into the out of night playground. Yeah, that's what happens a lot these days. They, they combine elements designed by him um, but kind of place them a bit aside, whereas here his jumping stones were, are almost just a decoration to... Uh, yeah. yeah, as a surrounding of it. And they exactly put it in the center. <laughs> yeah. That's like yeah. the ridiculous part. But also, um, so, many, yeah, so many got destroyed and uh, the ones that are left are often sharing their space with more uh, modern uh, equipment or um, what would be what would used to be a playground designed by Van Eyck would now be a totally new playground with maybe two or three jumping stones left. So it was also quite a discovery each time that we would go to one of these locations listed in in a book or in a list that we found in the archive. It would be a surprise what yeah. we would see. So what we expected and what we saw actually. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. not so many that are still left in the original state. Maybe just yeah. There is, here it is quite sad, especially because they put such a, a high play equipment there that it's like completely splits the playground into two of them. Therefore, the parents have to be constantly here and there on this side and on that side, which is uh, very unpractical also. And this is one of the playgrounds that we thought was still uh, Out of an, an original sure. one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we thought that they placed this, uh, this object in the middle late, later on, but we discovered that this is... Um, uh, yeah, a complete reproduction. So this is a company in the south of the Netherlands that um, has this Van Eyck section. So they have yeah, zillions of different choices of equipment you can buy, but there are a few of his designs which they bought the rights over and they, they placed it. And here they kind of try to recreate a composition that could have been a Van Eyck, but combined with a modern element yeah. in it. But yeah, this is really a good example for me. Uh, to show the difference between his equipment and the, and the ones that you Things see these days, the because you can really see that this is really meant as a castle. You know, you already, the architect or designer of this already um, determined yeah. what it should be used as or what it should be, where his things are so much more open to any association. And of course, it is quite the famous sad. ones. <laughs> Quite sad to see only a slide uh, with a, with a, some kind of a jumping uh, design these days. In the middle of a sandpit. <laughs> In the middle of the sandpit. Or seeing a horse, which is a horse, or a motorbike, which is a motorbike. This is uh, maybe the only like nice intention of the of the people who are like appreciating the work of Aldo van Eyck. This is the Rijks, uh, Rijksmuseum thing. Yeah, quite as I said, it's, it's quite a good gesture of them and um, really a good way of trying to uh, focus more on, on the playgrounds that are disappearing because they're only, not only being uh, taken out of the city, but the equipment that they take away, they, they destroy it. It's not that they somehow uh, keep, it keep them somewhere to hide them. Or yeah, it's really, yeah, it's quite sad. And I understand that with these concrete uh, things that you cannot keep all of them, but at least these frames, they... They're yeah. quite special. Yeah. Are, these, are those original ones that are? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. 
this is uh, yeah this was quite funny because while we were working on on the publication I was biking in the west of the city and I passed by a primary school and I found this uh, climbing frame standing behind the, bu the building totally yeah, abandoned abandoned <laughs> and it was so strange because we were just discovering how they were all disappearing and how there were so little left and then you run into this so I immediately contacted the school and I asked what what they were planning on doing with it and they were quite surprised that I was interested in it anyways and um, we tried to lift it yeah <laughs> we can just carry it <laughs> right away yeah we were thinking of taking it with us but then we decided to do it the, the, the legal way and, and talk to the owner and they were so happy that we wanted to take it they they were yeah they, they told me like the sooner the better we want to get rid of it but it would just cost too much money to destroy it because we would have to transport it and we don't really the transport wanna... is complicated it cannot be reassembled and we were like yeah, okay, we can maybe carry it, we can just take it somehow. So we were very enthusiastic and we thought that it's the best way to install it and to present it next to our school, where we were presenting also the book for the first time. But in order to fix it there, we needed to really like uh, use some kind of a concrete pillars in order to be fixed under the ground so it doesn't like uh, cause any trouble for the kids. It was like a temporary safety solution. Yeah, I mean, you see also that they chopped off four of the legs of the iglo because it was just easier for them to do it like that, since otherwise they would have opened, had to open the floor and, and dig, into dig in and uh, get these concrete pillars out. But they decided, let's just chop them off and deal with the problem later. Um, this is but how somehow it's quite... Uh, yeah, it still it didn't really change anything. The child would see it and, and still run towards it and use it. and. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone would, any of these children would be like, ah, this one is still there, I, I don't want to use it. I mean, they still recognized it immediately and... Um, and they had a lot of fun on it. It was during the, uh, like, a big exhibition there in, a, in front of the school. And it found such, like, because next to it is a kindergarten and a primary school, so people were always passing it and it found so many visitors that we were almost like, we were really hoping that we can keep it there, but the rules and of the... Of the Amsterdam policies are quite strict, so we couldn't keep it there longer than for 10 days at the moment. Yeah, but it's anyways, it was really great, even if it was just for 10 days, to see how, at least for this short period of time, we could give it a new place and a new life, and uh, whereas before it was just standing there as an object to be trashed. I mean, also the students were using it quite often. <laughs> um, and this is still, yeah, this is still ongoing. We're trying to find a, a place for it. Um, at first, we were thinking of maybe fixing it um, or try to find a way to make it more into this original shape. But I think it also it's kind of interesting how it's still working, even though it's it's a bit tilted. And um, we like that it has this story in it, but it's still functional enough. And we, we always, these days, when they ask us what we are doing, we say we just adopted the igloo. We have a lot of stuff to do with it. Yeah. But since the policies of Amsterdam safety issues were quite strict, we couldn't keep it on the ground because they said, okay, this is the play element which any child can see and then they're going to run into it and it's not safe. So you can fix it only somewhere where it's not going to be on the ground, but somewhere higher. Higher we or looking for this yeah. place like for ages because we were like, how we should, what should I put it in the roof or somewhere like in my house or I, we really yeah, it's didn't It's quite know. big, it's five by five, something like that. So. Especially in Amsterdam, try to find even finding a room from five by five is quite a luxury. So, imagine finding a place for your igloo. Um, and this was the only place that we were able to keep it so far. Also, because the city of Amsterdam is really scared that if a child would play on it and would fall down, you know, he would be responsible. There might be a lawsuit. So, this is where it is right now, and we're still um, trying to to find a new spot for it. And um, hopefully, that will work out someday. Yeah. And uh, just to give a little bit of hope, in the end of this presentation, we would like to end with a, with a very nice text. It was like uh, City in the Winter by Aldo Van Eyck. It's a part of his uh, essay writing the, city, uh, the Child, the City and the Artist. And basically, I have to find out where I have that. I would like to quote him. <laughs> so, when snow falls on cities, the child taking over for a while is all at once lord of the city. If childhood is a journey, let us see that the child does not travel by night. <laughs>
that's how we would like to give you for the future, future of the <laughs> playground. Yeah. Yeah, so this was basically it. <laughs> We are very open to any questions or any, anything you didn't understand in the presentation. So if you have uh, any ideas or <coughs> something, it was not clear enough. Yeah. I'm sure you have lots of questions, actually. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to ask you about the book and how you see the book functioning. You know, um, yeah. Who's it for? Do you see it as a kind of guidebook? Do you see it yeah, it's very much as a tour guide, yeah. always like, preserving this moment in time? You know, how will we look back on the book in 20 years? Or yeah. is that called action? You know, um, Basically, the book, as we said, it has the 17 chapters, and together with this chapter, we, we really wanted the, the book to be of a size that you can carry it around because all of the books are heavy and they are like not the ones you can take anywhere. And since this was a tour book, we really made it a pocket size, so it's basically this size. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can carry it around, and it's not predetermined that you have to make a tour from one to two to three. But basically, while once doing it, there are like short texts of basically what we are describing today, and uh, it's it's touching all the subjects of Aldo van Eyck, of this of his compositions, of his uh, position in the city of Amsterdam. And yeah, I think we yeah we really used those 17 locations to introduce you to 17 different aspects. And um, well, I find that a lot of Dutch people are really interested in it whenever we talk about them because they all grew up in these playgrounds. I mean, my generation, but my parents as well, they all, uh, they all played on at least one or two or three of these uh, elements. And we always felt like it was just a small chapter and it was paid not enough attention in all the books. So we wanted to make one chapter uh, a booklet for people just to also to put more attention on him as, a, as a, someone who had this great ideology of playgrounds, not just like of architecture, but that he, he is the person to learn from. And it's, it's a very simple language in a book. It's, it's like uh, approachable for anyone. And it's also the texts are of a line that when you stand there and you read it, you almost get this like poetic, poetic feeling of that you, you don't need a person describing you anything, but it's just like this book and you can, can guide Relate, you through. Yeah. 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 So that's about But in that sense, yeah, I think it's, we decided to do this because we, we discovered that so many of these playgrounds are, uh, are disappearing. So, in that sense, it's also a bit of a call for attention to this topic and uh, trying to introduce the importance of it before the few, the few that are still there are, are disappearing, so, yeah. You're yeah, related to that. Are there, are there any kind of um, organizations who are kind of looking to preserve these playgrounds? Like they, in the UK, you have the 20th Century Society. Oh, yeah. You're interested in kind yeah. of that sort of area and kind of looking to kind of not so much. I mean, you no, have this is what we are looking for now, and we had a couple of meetings, but we actually discovered that there is no one person behind it that is more divided by the districts of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and they more preserve the certain parts, and everyone is a bit differently taking care of of, uh, of the way it works. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is not like it doesn't belong to any uh, like architectural preserving, or uh, it's still not considered to be a monument. There's only Completely. one playground that has been named a monument now. Yeah. But besides that one, you can, yeah, anyone within the city of Amsterdam can decide, like, ah, yeah, we need, we need this location for, a, for I don't know, for, as a parking lot, so let's just take them out and, and demolish the, uh, or destroy the elements, and, and it's quite fine. And it's only since, also there was an exhibition about his work in 2001, and then people slowly started to reconsider the importance of them. And recently the foundation of Van Eyck has, uh, yeah, they, they started this foundation, and but they're even they're still focusing more on the on the architecture, on the buildings that he made, yeah, yeah. not so much on the playgrounds. So they're really yeah overlooked in that sense. It's quite a pity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's it, that is really terrible when you take into account that just how kind of aesthetic they were and yeah. are as spaces. The kind yeah. of thought process of particularly when you see the the kind of drawings. Yeah. That yeah. Did. They're just so kind of considered as kind of architectural spaces. Yeah. And if it was, I don't know, kind of somebody like the Gucci or something. That, that yeah, there would have been. Uh, right, they're, they're, yeah. It's just as, as aesthetic as. Well, yeah, they're school, they are schools to draw yeah. landscapes. Yeah. 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 <coughs> yeah, but because they were not titles as, as such, but really as a playground, they, yeah, it's not really clear what to do with them. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah.
I think that's part of the problem is that he's, he's an architect rather than an artist. If he'd yeah. been an artist, I think it might have been be easier. Tools. That's yeah. what I also think. Also, maybe it's the era where he was like in the point where he started that it was so much like um, collective work that there was not almost said that okay, this is the person behind it. And later on, they were just pointing on okay, it was Aldo van Eyck who came with it, but before it was almost like the city of Amsterdam made the playground. Yeah, there was not yeah. like one name behind yeah, the thing. He was the yeah. second employee of the city. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yes. It's, uh, so I think that's why the why the, the, the where the difference is that it was in many other cities also. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I mean, it's not even clear when we started to discover when we found some other playgrounds in Slovakia or something which was very similar to the play element he designed. We we're like. Okay, wait a minute, who made it first? Was there some other person? But they never put the names on the things also there. They say it was a responsibility of the city to create these spaces and yeah. there were many architects in the, so there is never a naming of the thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's yeah. why it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but here so here they do preserve these these playgrounds that were built. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And stuff gets lost all the time. You know? Yeah. I mean stuff that we can kind of research and obviously. Yeah. yeah. Go at school, school at things that are sculptures made by artists, and yeah. we don't know where they'll have. Like in Birmingham, there's 22 of these play sculptures designed by John Bridge, and there's one left, and, yeah. um, partly because they demolished the whole estate. But I think it is also to do with that idea of health and safety, and things get worn, and yeah, you know, exactly. everyone just freaks out. And kind of thinks you it's better to take them out and not deal with yeah. this problem, yeah. Uh, a similar point to that, actually, about health and safety. You said you came uh, against a lot of trouble from the council about uh, putting the old structure um, yeah. health and safety wise. Um, do you think that attitude is born out of um, these actual structures? Would, what was the general? Were there a lot of precedents of accidents and stuff? What was the yeah, general public's attitude towards them? It was kind of in the late eighties that uh, yeah, a few big accidents happened in public playgrounds and. That's when the city started to really reconsider that they have to think about these things and, and also make sure that they will not be responsible. So, um, yeah, in that sense, it was really linked to, to a few. I mean, uh, I would compare it to the fact that if, the, if something happens on the street and, for example, some accident happened, I mean, it's clearly you cannot blame an architect for designing a street this way or for going the car this way. I mean, it's, it's, it can be an accident. And of course, there is a big old probability that on a playground this accident might happen, but it's also easier to put the blame on someone. Therefore, I think from certain era, it was like, if you really wanted to get your, I don't know, to, to be right about something, you started to make a lawsuit of it. And, and I think that also belongs to kind of a development of the whole society, how we work and how it was before. But yeah, I think um, that, that there is no particular reasons, but it's all together somehow. It's a shame, at least children will go and play on scaffolding. Yeah, yeah. 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 And exactly. And then all of them back, so it's not, it's not really any difference. No. It's just like, yeah. yeah, except there's someone to play. No, but I feel that these days, that's the first thing that's considered when building a playground. First, it's like, okay, this is the location, but how are we going to make it as safe as possible? And, uh, and they completely forget about what it should like stimulate. It's just about like let's make it safe and like I don't know. And also, what I quite don't like nowadays is that they are made very. They are not anymore identical for the places, but they are almost like just like kind of stickers stick on the city and all over the other cities. And you kind of lose track of okay, why this should be special for Amsterdam? Why this should be special for any other country? So I think that's the difficulty of these online shops of playgrounds. Yeah. Back to the health and safety point, we had a talk earlier in the week with um, Paige Johnson, who's the author of this blog called Play Six, and she works out of America. And she was talking about this whole health and safety debate, yeah. and how um, she, she made an interesting comment about how when children play sports, uh, they injure themselves quite often, you're yeah. very active, but that's seen or deemed socially acceptable, yeah, but for true. some reason when it comes to play spaces, we yeah. get really protective really fast and yeah. ideas of health and safety start dominating yeah, the exactly. conversation. Yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Somehow, uh, then they don't, yeah, then it's just part of, of the play or part of the sports, but when it comes to these places, then they always want to point fingers or, yeah, yeah. yeah it's quite a pity. Tom, you know your choice of film that's on the screen over there. I wondered if you wanted to mention it and what you noticed of the playground that was up at Park Hill that linked 
you saw play a link to the Alder Van Eyck? Yeah, I mean, there was, there was uh, in one of the older images of the Alder Van Eyck, the one with all the kind of triangles in, in yeah. the ground, it's kind of a strip. Yeah. There's one of those kind of turning, yeah. like it's got loop things that kind of rotate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's well. really good. Yeah. And there's one of those at the, that must have been, whether it was like in a Park Hill when it was first opened, because we can't, I haven't seen it in the film, but we went up there the, yesterday, before yesterday, and, and it's that's still there alongside a kind of yeah. like thing with the plastic slide and kind of time structure. Um, but then also, there's, there are those kind of, like they've obviously made a bespoke, they made a bespoke kind of climbing structure and kind of concrete thing at Park Hill that kind of comes up a few times in that. Yeah, that yeah it come, it's really somehow great. really, yeah. Uh, and that's like that, that sort of parts, elements of that. If you're watching it, I don't quite know where it appears, so you yeah. have to sit through the entire film, but there is um, a point where there's this really tall tower in kind of quite, quite looks like quite roughly welded metal, and there's just a, a girl sitting on top of it, or a boy sitting on top of it, and it's obviously quite high, and that's concrete underneath with concrete lumps around. It. <laughs> so it's about a million times more dangerous than Aldo Van Eyck. Yeah, which is presumably why they got rid of it. Which is presumably why they got rid of it. And it, I mean, I think that sort of health and safety thing is something we've been facing a little bit with some of the the spaces that we've been designing for mm-hmm. public things. But it's one of the other things that always gets brought up is cost. Yeah. It's always like the playground, the kind of play spaces, I think some all too often seen as some almost like a necessary evil as part of the development for developers. Yeah. I mean that's probably not exclusively true, but isn't that there is some I think there is some truth in that. It's about like that when we're designing, working with landscape architects and Stuff. Yeah, often they just assume they soon put in a bunch of off the shelf equipment. Yeah, exactly. And maybe I think it's a, there's two things that develop. sometimes can be a sort of thorn in the side for developers and landscape architects. One is having to put in things like play the other one is having to work with artists. Yeah, that's exactly. where they, you know, we like to make things a bit more difficult for them, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, you know, we're referencing all this stuff that then is. It seems problematic because we want to do things with concrete and stuff like yeah. that. And because I think there's still a lot of scope for kind of re reinvestigating it all. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I was wondering about the um, how much in the kind of archives are there kind of like details about of what like the composition of the concrete was and that. It's kind of it's stuff? really difficult to find because even within the archive if they. They are missing a lot of documents. They even yes. admitted to us that they don't know like why it was not collected earlier or if some things disappeared within the process of uh, like perceiving it. But there is a lot of materials which are missing and a lot of photos of the playgrounds are missing also. And so. Yeah, but I mean, you saw earlier this uh, series of photographs of the before and after shots and that's when the city of Ar- uh, Amsterdam really decided like, okay, we need to yeah. document these places because they might, you know, uh, end up uh, being demolished because they have to make place for buildings. So this this was uh, one aspect that you can still find, but other than that, it's really uh, well. You have these letters. That's quite a huge, uh, uh, yeah, uh, thing. But besides that, it's it's a bit difficult to find uh, his sketches and his work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm really interested in the idea of photography and how it relates to place culture and place spaces. Yeah. Actually, because one thing, I mean, part of it is like a post-processing of these spaces after we've made them, and photography is a really good tool for that. Mm-hmm. And it's a certain part of nostalgia, right? Like the yeah. images are really beautiful, um, yeah. or maybe they're images that of spaces you played in when you were a child, yeah. from yeah. a certain generation. But also, I was really struck in your talk by um, a few things. One is the loss of color. Yeah. Had never occurred to me in all of the black and white images I have been looking at over the residency. Yeah. And the other is the fact that you use video yeah. Yeah. and um, how that totally shifted the way that I thought about these structures yeah. that yeah. I've been looking at with Simon mm. and Tom from the yeah. yeah. It gave us like a first person view. Yeah. Um, but also I wonder if photography is a really problematic tool in a certain way, because 
um, you know, if you if you're looking at a space that no longer exists and you're only looking at it from one angle, then you lose yeah. like the yeah, exactly. Of the three and three sixty experience, yeah. which has a big effect on how you um, perceive. Yeah. Yeah, especially in his uh, in his uh, compositions that were really, you know, it was so important that there was no front and back or center or. Uh, one way to to use them, or from one point of view, it was really uh, meant as this dynamic uh, place. But I which think is, yeah, it, yeah. in our case, what really helped when we were doing the photography was the idea that we this book is meant to be like to be brought in a place, or somehow that this this will be a tool for you also just to give you more. But we find the presence of the of being in a place. As a, as a very important aspect. And therefore also for this presentation we chose the video because we saw, okay, it's another way of presenting something and we can move it a bit forward with this. We, we didn't want to keep it as static, but uh, I think we never tried to also take photography with the children because we really appreciated it also as, as almost like some kind of a pattern or some kind of a, just like a composition which is never super centered in our photography, but it was always like, taking a bit of each part of the space, but it was never just focusing centered on anything. So we always want to give a fragment of the feeling. No, but I think, but yeah. it was maybe intuitive also how we took the pictures, because almost some people look at them and they say, wow, they are so, such a snapshot quality of them. They really feel also that we, we didn't highlight it so much, but we rather want to keep it very, very real somehow. Yeah. No, but it's true that you get a totally different uh, experience or idea of the space once you video it and also once you um, I mean of course there's also different ways of filming it you could have also just walked around the playground and shown it to you like that but um, yeah I think you know really using the elements uh, is it's basically that's how we did the films we, we did it as we would use it somehow if it was possible so that was got quite yeah. some interesting response of the people passing by every now and then but yeah <laughs> so that was and also for the book, maybe we can say that we decided to not to use the color because, I mean, that's all connected with the fact that if the person is on the spot and also that the, the photos get this kind of more appreciation of the form, even though if we look at the images in color, we also see that there is not so much color in general in them. They have very natural like, quality of the and materiality. So, but the, on the contrary, when we read about Aldo van Eyck, he really liked or he wanted to take photographs with the children, yeah. which was also interesting. He, he liked to have them in, in the playground using them and as many as possible, so he was rather capturing them as that. Yeah, and that's that, maybe also the contrary of what we did at the moment. No, but yeah, going back to your question where you asked how it's documented and how much you can find in the archive, um, that's, that is quite a, a rich... Uh, part of the things that is still remaining of his work. There's plenty of these photographs, so the, the playgrounds with children and families in them, using them, and um, yeah, much more than, than the technical drawings or, uh, yeah. or these I mean, things. You can see how some of those old photos, particularly the one, there's that one that seems to come up quite often in a lot of the books where there's some boys on the jumping, the so, round jumping stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, if you imagine that image without it, it the kids in it. Yeah, it will be completely, completely different. Kills yes. the yeah, yeah, sense yeah. of how they engage with yeah. And the sense, actually what it does is give a sense of scale and all those things as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can sort of, it is kind of um, yeah. from that, like from the, you can see why he would do that kind yeah. of stuff in the, in the document. Yeah. But I think also that our publication, the way we took photography was more like posing a question or giving a comment or like creating a discussion of what it is, why we should keep it, and so it's very much like taken from this perspective. Which, in, in some point, we, we also felt like it visually misses all this research. When we did it, we had the feeling there is missing something in the whole research, like certain way of photography, certain way of capturing it. There was always constantly coming the same images, and you, after a while, you had a feeling, wow, it's cool, but we need something from this period of time. So that's what was the biggest maybe motivation for us to take it to create our own Yeah, Yeah, I mean, in this publication that we will publish, it's just, um, there will be only photographs that are taken these days. So we decided not to use any of these archival photographs. Also because if you want to, to have a look at those, you can find plenty of other uh, books and... Which are dedicated to yeah. the more history part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much.